secured uh, a lot of funding for these big, big, big projects that are in and around Dallas. Um, she's also the first member of Congress to introduce a congressional resolution recognizing the significance of Ramadan. As a member of Congress, she has traveled the world bringing a message of hope, peace, vision, and love to people, no matter their ethnicity, their faith, or the language they speak. And so, as we're here today, we'd like to support her, support her message, and support the me message she has for diversity. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and inviting all of you to come and meet me, and I hope bring some money. <laughs>
I ran for office less than a decade after Martin Luther King, John Lewis, and all that group fought and got us the right to vote under President Lyndon Johnson, a native Texan. And so I have lived through the times of seeing the difference and being an extremely segregated racist society to moving closer to a diverse, equal society. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. And you can be a major part <coughs> of what's getting there. Many of you are very successful business people. People that look like me didn't have that opportunity many years of my life to even have businesses. But you're coming and you're showing an example and showing that it can be done and it's helped to influence a lot of folks who always felt they were left out feel a degree of hope that it can happen. So I want to thank you for what you've been able to bring to this country and the contributions that you're making through your examples of leadership and entrepreneurship and community leadership and political participation. It is much, much appreciated. I thank you very much. I will try to answer any questions you may have. Um, you can ask me anything but my age. <laughs> I was kidding because my mother-in-law told me a long time ago, never ask young people to guess your age because they're going to always get you 100 years more than you are. <laughs> Uh, just 
recently they showed one house in one of the Carolinas that did stand. And many times when they do that, people don't understand what that really means. I don't know how many of you remember the storm in Galveston several years ago, and probably close to 10 years ago. They kept showing that White House as they would go in to do the news that was standing. Well, the real lesson there is that that White House was a part of a neighborhood. And everything in that neighborhood was wiped away except that White House. They showed one recently in the storm that's hit now. The one two-story place that's still standing. And I don't know why they don't give the whole story about it, because I think it would educate the public. That was a place that was also built with resilient materials. And it was able to stand when everything around it was torn up. That's the kind of thing we need to look forward to, building for the future. Any of you live in a high-rise know that when they build these high-rises now, they got these huge cylinders uh, post. And that's because it stabilizes that building for seismic <coughs> movement with these heavy winds. So we've come a distance through that research to see some of the things that we've got to do in order to save materials. We have learned to predict far enough ahead that if people would take the notice, they can get out of the dangers of it. It's just very difficult for people to make up their mind to walk away from everything they own materially and leave it to be torn down by the wind and the rain. That would be hard for me, and that's hard for everyone else. And some people just say, I'm just going to stay and see what happens. Those are the ones that normally lose life. There's no guarantee of saving materials at this point. But I have put research demands in every deal that I could to start to look to building buildings with resistance so that they can withstand some of this. Because no matter when we grasp that we the things that we must do to deal with global warming, it's gonna take a while. It took a while to get here. It's going to take a while to get minds ready to get beyond it. So we're going to be looking forward to these kind of weather changes in the foreseeable future. And that's one of the things that my committee has jurisdiction over, is that kind of all basic research, but certainly that kind of research. The other committee I serve on, just as long as I've been on this one, is transportation and infrastructure. And I've tried to use that time to look out, not only for this area, but for the state of Texas, and when I get what I get out to the rest of the country. <laughs> uh, you always look out your own areas uh, first. And so all of the federal building, freeways and whatever around here, uh, that has come from my area. Sorry, the reason we cut off because a uh, lot of uh, people has to go because there is a seven o'clock there is an event in our uh, Jamaat Khana. So I invite all of them to please go forward with the eating. And whoever wants to uh, ask question, whoever wants to leave, they can eat and leave. But other people can ask the question. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I call, I call, he's got a mouth diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir.
Well, now I'm beginning to wonder if there's going to be enough of this water piece coming. Um, look, since not everything is happening here tonight, every day, but when you observe week to week and year to year, it's very clear that this earth is getting more. And we've got to do what we need to do to preserve life. Of, of life, of human and and food supply, animals, all of that. Because when we see that only heat diseases spread more food, when it doesn't get cold enough to kill some of the bacteria and funguses uh, in the exterior of your home, then it continues to live. And we pour only against and we don't have the capacity at this time to have the antibiotics that covers all of these unforeseen infections and bacteria in the skin. Bacteria travel around the world more easily in warm weather. Because if it doesn't freeze it, if we have good freezes, we know that it's going to freeze the lava and freeze the various bacteria. But if it doesn't freeze, it keeps living. And it begins to move around. So those bacterial diseases that used to really be very common in very warm places in the world, it was warm and moist, you began to see them spread around the, the whole universe. Uh, what do you say about uh, Jamal and the Saudi journalist uh, What about you say that? Well, it's difficult to know what, what the function of Congress will be in that uh, because on an international scale, it's just what, what limits us is that our law is made for this country. And we can follow this country. But our law is not and so while we can put a great deal of pressure on forcing them to come forth with the truth and deal with them as we deal in the system of justice, it's more difficult when, first of all, you got a question who's not even an honest person. Uh, and secondly, uh, secondly, it almost seems like there was conspiracy to get the actions here before it was left open. Now, in this country, we have a constitutional right of freedom of speech, First Amendment right in our Constitution. That's not true of what the world is. And from what I can tell, the reason you were learning is because of the stories he had written here in this country completely protected by the Constitution. But they were him over there. And what it appears is that they were over some places of the middle. But, but it's hard to tell because we haven't had anyone who could really tell us the real truth. It eventually, I think, will leak out. But I'm not sure that we have a president who is expecting outrage for something like that happening that's totally against our Constitution or somebody losing their life or expressing their opinion. And we guarantee, in our First Amendment of the Constitution, the freedom of speech. Uh, I'm talking about the freedom of speech and the First Amendment. Uh, do you know the House Resolution 1697? That is, uh, that will come and that is talking about the anti, it's called anti-BDS law, the white population yeah. sanction. A group that is, uh, that passed for Wi-Fi service and sanction of Israel because of the human rights for the faith and social rights. Now, the Congress passed in 1697 that is coming that would limit that speech. And it's not only uh, uh, sponsored by the Republicans, it has a number of Democrats also that are signing as a sponsor of that. How can they reconcile the, on one side 
I did speak or speak or something, I can ask for my card or sanction of Israel if I want to. I'm not necessarily that I would, but if I want to, I should be able to do that. The bill that then criminalize that speech, it's colliding with the Constitution. We talked to uh, one of the sponsors of his more recent. We tried to talk to him. And uh, I don't know what kind of an issue that Jackson Lee is also a sponsor of it. I know you are not. And uh, I hope that you would never support that. Uh, but there are 274 co signers. How can we reconcile that with Constitution? Well, it's, it's difficult, but let me just say this. There are times when so many bills sometimes hit at the same time in each of this, that there are times that people can sign and later realize that they made a mistake. I've done it, and I'm sure that many others have. But let me also say that sometimes during campaign time, you can be approached by somebody, they'll give you one side of the story and you don't know the other side. Um, there, there is not an overwhelming number of Jewish people uh, in the Congress, but those who are there, for the most part, are very, very wealthy, get a lot of money, you, you cannot outraise them. Like the uh, Schumer was in the house, he always had 10, 15 billion dollars in the bank. And there are people who were afraid to go, go against him because they thought he'd raise money against them. Uh, he probably has more than that. And, but there is an organization called J Street that's very fair and open about examining issues. And when I'm approached by someone, and it could be a, a friend, uh, ask me to do something. What I try to do is look at the background of it to try to understand it because you don't always get the full picture when you're approached about it. I'm lucky to have a very excellent staff that helps me to read through some of that. I will say this, that uh, Mark Beeson's experience had been pretty limited before he came. He had worked the only political experience he had was he worked for Martin Cross, who was a very pro-Israel Jewish uh, person. And that could be the influence. Uh, and he now is kind of an extension of him. He, he really goes along with whatever he tells him. And so he, and when I approached him about it, he just said he believed in being loyal to person who has caused him to succeed. I, I, I do think that he's a reasonable individual. It might take a little bit more education uh, to help with that. I don't, I can't, it's hard for me to comment on Sheila, but she was everywhere. And um, whatever train is leaving, she's going to get on. So I'm not really sure what her influences are. But most of the time, we discuss something like this in Congressional Black Caucus, and we're very sensitive to the rights, especially of the oppressed, and we all know, we all stand in shock of how they're allowing uh, Israel to keep the Palestinians right now. It's unbelievable, and it's getting worse. And, it, and a lot of it, uh, I think, because the president's son-in-law is Jewish, and he must be influencing us. Uh, we are very appalled by it, and it and it expressed how unhappy we are. And but you know, there are two major groups that grab up people as soon as they get there to take them to Israel. And the first one is APAC uh, that try to get a hold of everybody that they can to get them to Israel to see it from their vantage point. And you only see one side. But if you go to K Street, you begin to see the real and whole picture. And, 
And to me, that I mean, that's where I have confidence uh, in, in seeking advice sometimes to the J Street group. Because you don't always get the true picture of the other side. But that is the side with the most money, too, in fact. It's unfortunate. But when you go there and you see what happens, there's no way you can go along with what's going on. The media does not even describe it well over here. Um, the minute you get on a plane and go overseas, you see Federal Times is a different tone than New York Times is. And I think that the Washington Post owns Federal Times. But you don't see that kind of clear light in any major data paper in this country. But the minute you get access to media that is credible, that does not have the control of the American press, you begin to see the real picture. Especially the European. Yes. And so. I'm sure they will. Now, you know, J Street is fairly new, but they're coming on strong, and more people, more and more people are beginning to join. There are uh, people here that are just really diehard APAC people that are beginning to shift to J Street because many of the APAC people are doing what they've heard. They haven't been over there to see it. But when you go there and you see what the real picture is, you cannot leave that. If you have any sense of justice in your heart anyway, you cannot leave there and, and feel that it's on the right side of that picture. It's just, you just can't. I mean, it's just so obvious when you go there and see what's going on. The 1697 violates the First Amendment, of course. Yes. And many of them, most of them that are doing that, are not from Vanity. 
there are people who've been coming back to the homeland by encouragement. And, and so, that's how I got and y'all who gets his, his power. He recruits people to come off to the homeland. They take foreign aid and build them houses all over the same territory. And then they follow him. But for people who are with them, that's who he does have. And the people, because they got inner marriages, in a business relations, all of that. And the first trip that I made there, and we went out to dinner, one of the leading women in that group said, I want you to know that this is important for me to die. But it hurts me to sit here because this land is where my grandparents were born. This is their business that was taken away. And now, Thank you. 
white and no life of their own. If anything else, they don't like to get good for that. That's the kind of stuff you gotta watch. On the other hand, y'all have to so who is one and the Democrat. On the bench, he's worked to rehabilitate and get people to get into programs and education and training instead of sending 10 years behind uh, bars when they had a marijuana cigarette or something. And so you got to make sure that people that go into those positions have some sensitivity. And we've got to learn how to ask them questions prior to them going because it's more tricky. But somebody who's running for judge who can hide behind that cabinet on this here, I don't have to look at every case as they come before me. And they do you that answer, you know they hide the uh, You got to make sure that they have, they ask the question more. Do you believe in long sentences or rehabilitation? And then if you believe in rehabilitation, what are your plans to put into action? Because most of the people that go to prison, many of them, it ain't rehabilitation, it's habilitation. The poorest are educated people of their rural great numbers. We've got some educated people in there. But the majority are people that have no skills and no money. So we got a penal system in this country that lock up poor people. And so uh, the only way you change that is to change the mentality of the persons in charge of that system, that judicial branch. And when they look and they start to focus on rehabilitation and growing and building human lives, you'll see a difference. How about the bare bone system? The bail bond system is, is another unfair system because the average poor person don't have anything to put up his bond. They don't, most of them don't even have a house, let alone on the property. And if they had any money, they probably wouldn't be in trouble in the first place. So the bail bond system does need change. Well, if you notice, most of the strong male bond systems that are against people in the South, it was just another old tactic to keep poor people down and locked up. But if you look outside the South, you see a lot of bond systems that have alternatives coming up with a lot of money. And they, and they might have people to take a course or reviewing something they've done or going ahead and getting a license and all that. There are a lot of ways that you can build a life instead of destroying it. How about the municipalities that are using justice system to raise that? Um, a lot of, you know, like writing tickets um, and just basically, uh, it's, it's a... Uh, well, in some places, in Texas, that's how they get their economy. <laughs> hey, it's, and, and it's pretty well known. You can be driving someplace and you'll say, this area in this county right here, the economy depends on how many tickets are written. And so that's the well established behavior. And, so, and, and, and that too is an unfair tactic that mainly catches low income people. Uh, because when they can't pay, they pay through their human blood who work and, and, and once they get a, a charge, they can never live it down, they never, they never, they never allow them to do the rehabilitation. And so all of these systems that were established and these two happened the way they were used those were established for discrimination. And we got to have people in place now that are smart enough to have to change that, get them wrong to it. I'm okay. 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 I
You have to tell him two minutes. <laughs> no, my question because I, I have friends who are coming to Kashmir that came to me and it was strong. Uh, that issue was the infant maternal mortality. I just did the and I just did the highest in the world. Well, a lot of it is education, and a lot of it is availability of care. Uh, health care is a problem most, is a first of all, health care is something 100% of the population that needs it so So anything that we know that every human being is going to be needed, ought to be something that's available to people at a reasonable cost. But in this area, healthcare is the highest cost in the nation. That eliminates more than half the people the ability to get healthcare. The Affordable Care Act that they call the Obama Care was attempting to address that very issue. We have looked at the cost of health care in this area compared to Atlanta, even Houston, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles. This is the highest place in the nation for the cost of health care. And we are one of the poorest states when it comes to health care coverage. First of all, we have the largest number of working people that cannot afford health care coverage. That's what Obamacare was intended to address. We have the largest number of working people that don't have positions, that are able for food stamps, but they're working for the time. That's our problem. We've gotten to the point now where positions have to make it too, so they're not going to put an office in a very low income area to make it convenient for low income people because they can't make it money. And so the persons who are that low income don't have access to get into the transportation is the last thing they do for low income areas. And so just trying to find somebody who is going to take a patient who has the ability to pay is hard. I'll tell you about it. Three or four weeks ago, no, it's been longer than that. I, I went on this multi country trip, and when I was landing in Ireland, I was refueled coming back, I just had this terrible head pain that ended up in my sinuses and my ears and everything. It was a kind of a altitude sinus thing. I got back and went to the doctor and they said I had fluid in each of my ears. And I had a cricket. It would sound like a cricket uh, in my ear. And so they put me on antibiotics. And then I decided I was going to go to an ear specialist to check to see what else I could do. When I was trying to make the appointment, they wanted to know that before they even took my appointment, they wanted all of my Medicare, healthcare coverage, everything out front, because they were not going to see me if, if they were not assured they were going to be paid. Now, I have this coverage, but can you just imagine an African American living somewhere in South Dallas trying to get an appointment with a specialist and don't have healthcare coverage? Now, go ahead. That's why you see more deaths of black women dying when they're having babies. And that's why you see so much uncompensated care of all of these various hospitals. Because they are not getting preventive, they're not getting preventive care for almost anything. A flu shot will cost you 10, 20 dollars. And it's to everybody who benefit from somebody gets access to a flu shot, because if you get flu, you can spread it to 100 people. And so I just believe that we were headed in the right direction. Under the
good plan we were trying to put together for the work of 56 times under President Obama. This, this plan started way, way back. And finally came to some fruition. It was not perfect. We did the best we could do. And we intended to improve it. But instead, we're fighting to save the last strands of it. That's because health care is a cash cow to some. But it's one of the best investments that city, county, state government can make. Because if you got a sick workforce, you can't do good business. Exactly. I have been to the governor's office many times to talk about that. And in the last time I was there was just before the election. And he said, oh, he's got a plan. And we're going to sit down and work on it. Oh, and then trust that way. And then he would get that. That is an issue that's a very important issue question. because, first of all, no physician can go through that years of training and then practice with you. So they have to have some guarantee. But it is up to a in a society to make sure people have access to plans that help them pay. I don't know anybody who can pay health bills without the support of some type of insurance support. You know, you've got to have Medicare, you've got to have something. If you're working, you can be able to share that. I believe that it's a right that every person has. Because it takes a lot of input for people to go through medical school. That's going to be a minimum of eight years of college. And they usually have uh, student loans up to $300,000. They can't work for them. But they've got to have some way to have some type of help for that patient. Because they can't take every patient that's not paying. They couldn't stay in business. we got it very lopsided. The insurance companies have been in charge of health care in this country for many, many years. They determined everything about it. The Obama approach was to put some of that uh, back way the loans away from the riches of insurance companies. And medical insurance companies were the richest institutions in this country because they would insure people all the way up until they needed it, and then they started ratcheting it. They, and when we put in there that someone can sit on a plan for age 26, well, they made their most money from 18 to 26 or 30. Those people in that age group they have an insurance policy and never use it. But as soon as they start using it, 25, 30, or 40, high blood pressure, whatever, they ready to dump it. And as soon as they really get where they need it, at 60 or 65, they make Medicare the first pay. So they only have to pay what Medicare does not pay. But you've been paying them ever since you 18. So it's an upside down situation that we're trying to correct. And I hope we'll continue to have an opportunity to work on it. And we get the right people in Congress. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. We have a food. I want each and every one to please go ahead and eat it. Congressman, you want to bring it to you or? No, no, no.